Hello and welcome to Path to Power. There's one or two things have happened since we last spoke to you. I'm Matt Cooper. And I'm Ivan Yates. OK, obvious place to start outside of Ireland, the attempted assassination of Donald Trump and what it means for his potential re-election as President of the United States and what that in turn means for Ireland. Are you one of these people, Ivan, who now thinks that as a result of this, it's a done deal he has it won? Yeah. Uh, my my point of reference is the book is Biden's 20 to 1. So the separate issue, Biden is absolutely not going to be the candidate. And I think, by the time people listen to this, yes. I think it's very likely he'll have gone. Exactly. Uh, the reason why it's a game changer for Trump leaving aside the disarray in the Democrats, which means they're sort of imploding. As I said last week, I felt he could beat Kamala Harris or anyone else. And I know there's a bit to go on it. What actually happened, in my view, politically from the assassination was... He wasn't assassinated. Yes, yeah, 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 assassination. <laughs> and sorry, just on the negative side first, this whole almighty God and divine thing, like... Was it the divine decision that Corey Compatori would die? Like, yeah. how daft is that? Yeah, I mean, I've met core people this week who feel they have a divine right to win the All-Ireland on Sunday. I just don't believe in any of this horse shite about divine this or that or the other. Sorry, but, did you see the Marjorie Taylor Greene interview in which she was, you know, this is a Republican congresswoman, in which she showed that, did you see how the flag, just before the shot, the American flag, furled itself into the shape of an angel and that gave protection to Donald Trump because God decided that he would not yes. die. All that worthless analysis I would be in, but what I would say is this. Part of uh, Trump's narrative for the last two years is victimhood. That he's a victim, he's been taken on by Biden's judicial system. This assassination plays to the victimhood narrative for him. And that, for me, is a game changer that a lot of middle ground people, both within the Republican Party and independent voters, will kind of see that angle of victim. OK, I'm going to make a little bet with you okay. if you take it up. Yeah. Now, I don't, you'll probably scoff at me because I'll say, you'll say this is way too small. Okay. But if Donald Trump is inaugurated next January, I'll give you the 25 quid. But if he's not inaugurated, you give me 125. Well, no, I'll tell you exactly. I can walk into Paddy Powers, Ladbrokes or Boy Sports and back him today because I actually was yeah. thinking of it this morning. The worst price is two to seven and the best price is one to two. So I'll give you 50 or maybe 75 because I'm so certain. I'll, I'll take no, odds sorry. of one to three. One to three, if you're that certain. Yeah, well, no, sorry, that's just the market. No, why no, why would I'm I asking... give you one to three when I can back it at one to two, Pat? <laughs> and Matt, like for heaven's sake, I mean, let's look at economics of gambling here. So you're not, you're not actually that confident that he's going to win. I'll tell no, you why. No, I'm, I'm very confident. I'll tell you why I think it's not a done deal. Okay. I'll give you a number of reasons, right? This is forlorn, wishful thinking, but you, carry on. You can say that, but have a listen anyway. Okay. First of all, the Democrats now, when they change the candidate, will go hell for leather. There have been some really strong campaign messages in the last couple of days. Um, Kellyanne Conway's husband, George Conway, put up a terrific video, which I'd recommend to all of our listeners to have a look at. I'll tweet it out again. And it just literally eviscerates Trump in five minutes of just what, how absolute and much a liar and what a danger he is. And you, you watch that and you if you have any cop on, you go, Jesus, how could you make a man like him be president again? That's one thing. The other thing that I thought that Trump displayed last night was hubris, right? He thinks he's already won it. And that's a very dangerous position to be in four months out to actually think this is in the bag, I've got it. And a couple of decisions that he'd made which illustrate that level of hubris. I mean, one is the ridiculous striptease by Hulk Hogan in introducing Trump last night. Hulk Hogan is a pretty despicable character. He, um, he was a guy that he sort of lost his way because there was a video broadcast by Gawker of him having sex with one of his friend's wife and that sort of But the other thing is he was, he outed himself as a racist. He was boasting in another filmed encounter how he said, yeah, I'm a racist. And he was giving out about his daughter uh, having sex with an F and N. I'm not going to use the words. And he, which he repeated on a regular thing. So Hulk Hogan, to an awful lot of America, is no hero. This guy was cancelled. He's now been rehabilitated by Trump. And that's the sort of thing that there's an awful lot of the undecided still and a lot of women, when they see an alternative to Biden, they'll say, we don't like the people that Trump hangs around with. And then it's J.D. Vance. 
as his vice presidential nominee. And I would have read Hillbilly Elegy when it came out in 2016. Tell me about it. It's a, a Was fast, it a novel or no, no, it's a, it's a, a memoir? It's a memoir, yeah, okay. autobiography. Okay. And it's fascinating. I mean, I wonder how much of it may What does the word elegy mean? Elegy means uh, praise, paean of praise okay. to them. Okay. So it, it was fascinating in describing his upbringing, it, not in the Appalachians, as people say, because actually where he had moved to as part of this movement of people out of Kentucky and other places from the Appalachia region into a nearby industrial things. And then, of course, uh, the jobs were all lost because of offshoring and uh, poverty took hold and alcoholism and drug use. And he grew up in a pretty dreadful situation. But it was all about sort of dragging himself up by the bootstraps and how he went on. He went to Yale and he's an exceptionally bright individual and he wrote the book very, very well. And it is fascinating. But he was an anti-Trumper. He was able to see Trump for the fraud that he is. And now he's done this complete 180 degree turn and he's suddenly deifying Trump and Trump's my man and all the rest of it. He's a grifter himself but he's a much cleverer grifter than Trump. And Trump has left a cuckoo into the nest. And that that person is, um, Vance is very much advanced by the likes of Peter Thiel, who is one of the tech bros, one of the billionaires, who has been a sinister force in American politics and also was, and here's the link to Hulk Hogan, was the guy who financed Hulk Hogan's legal action against Gawker to bring it down because Thiel had a grudge. So he's one of these free speech merchants until the free speech is turned against him. Anyway, Trump has brought these people into his orbit and it may be the one time that he will lose a little bit of control. Anyway, the problem for us is Vance is the type of person who wants, hey, Ukraine, I don't care. No more American support from Ukraine. He'll influence Trump in relation to that. His economic ideas are dynamite. They will literally, he is going to encourage Trump's already beliefs in relation to enormous tariffs on China and on Europe. And these guys could actually cause a massive recession in the United States of America and as the debate unfolds in the coming months, OK, you might say that all gets a little bit too detailed for a lot of voters, but Trump has his base. But there are people there, as we've seen here in Ireland, people swing very quickly back to somebody else if they don't necessarily appeal to them. It's not over yet. OK, there's two phrases have come into the lexicon since I left politics. One is gaslighting mm. and the other is virtue signalling. Yeah. Is the last five minutes virtue signalling? No, but what we've been taking from... Just that I understand it. It's not. No, absolutely not. But I'll tell you what the Republicans have been doing and what the Congress this week or the convention was, was the ultimate in gaslighting. Ever since, say, for example you know, telling Democrats, oh, you're responsible for Trump getting shot at. You're the ones who are encouraging violence. Well, actually, Donald Trump has spent the last eight years encouraging violence. It visited his door. But the idea that Joe Biden is responsible for all of this because in one private conversation, which got leaked, he used the phrase about putting a bullseye on Donald Trump, which is a figure of speech. That is nothing by comparison with what Trump is doing. So the gaslighting is coming from... No, it's the, the virtue signalling I was referring well, to. Well, what do you think virtue signalling uh, Well, uh, well it, it, it's kind of this high uh, altitude, high altar kind of preachy stuff that, that people find quite objectionable. But where, where was it? Uh, <laughs> no, well, in terms of, no, like your standards are better than someone like J.D. Vance. And, and no, it's no, almost... I, I, sorry, I didn't say that actually, because funnily enough, an awful lot of the standards that he advanced in Hillbilly Elegy, I would have found very, very interesting about doing things for yourself, having standards in life where you try and improve rather than actually believing that everybody else does it for you. But what Vance has done now is that he's flipped onto the Trump thing. You're all victims, you're all victims, and it's a big scam. And now Vance is engaged in the scam okay. against which he once okay. railed. The reason why I dismiss most of that is wishful thinking. I do take the point about hubris, but actually I think if he's more confident, he'll actually mellow a bit and be no, more no. magnanimous. Did you hear the speech last night? Oh, well, put it like this in the beginning. I heard the beginning of it. And, and then he talked he, about unity. He didn't want yeah, half America. And the, and he then, wanted whole of America. And then he veered off into the old Donald Trump. Uh, yeah, anti-immigrant and, and all of that. So I just... And you uh, say that's virtue no, signaling no, 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 to be... Well, well, <laughs> to condemn well, what, what anti I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is this. When you analyse the outcome of any election, you've got to break it down into the constituent parts. The blue states and the red states, no matter what happens, no matter who the candidate is, no matter what Trump does, won't change. 
the data coming from the eight swing states is is just irreversibly shifting in Trump's direction. Nothing is irreversible. Nevada, Wisconsin, um, Pennsylvania, all of those states are are turning red. And and I think that Vance actually copper fastens that. Um, and, and put it like this, uh, we know, uh, you know, in California and New York, they're going to vote blue. But I actually think he has it in the back. The thing I think that it's not acknowledged about the first term of Trump to reassure people who are not sleeping easily this weather with the prospect of election is that he is not a warmonger. That if you actually look at what he did, you could actually say in terms of Putin or North Korea, he's actually an appeaser. But he is not someone who on his watch will have body bags, US body bags. And I think, uh, yes, he's going to be isolationist. Yes, he's going to make Europe pay for its own security. Yes, he is going to uh, put America business first. But that look, the fact of the matter is, he American politics is different. I mean, in my view, what's much more important before everyone gets their knickers in a knot is to actually say, the most external political thing that we have to worry about, and it's been a great development this week, is Anglo-Irish relations. Sorry, I will get to that in one second. But actually, funny enough, when you say about Anglo-Irish relations, did you see what Vance said about Britain? Vance believes that Britain could be the first uh, Muslim country. Muslim yeah. country, Islamist country. Oh, that was a joke. It wasn't that a joke. That was a joke. Oh, you see, that's... A, the no, first you, nuclear you could power, be, he you said. Could yeah. be, you could be very naive at times. <laughs> you actually could be really naive. But he actually said... Because it. You, I actually saw that clip. I don't see a lot of this stuff, but uh, I saw that clip and there was a kind of uh, a smile on his face and the way he said it. It was actually a very witty speech to the Conservative Association or something like that. And it was it was actually kind of, and I think the Tories are allied to this, it was having a quip. And I mean, it was about Sunak and all that kind of good stuff. And But like that, that put it like this, you're now, you're now taking yourself too seriously. <laughs> well, I wish you'd take yourself more seriously, <laughs> perhaps. Go on, talk to me about anglo Irish. Well, I'm, I'm going to surprise you with something I'm going to say well, to you well, about well, this. Well, well, but as I say, before people get too upset or fixated with America, much more important, 30-40% of our trade is the UK. Sorry, it's not much more important. Sorry, this, don't downplay it, the importance of what happens in America when we have so much multinational investment from But that's America corporate America. America. That's not political America. Have you not seen what's happening with corporate America? What will happen if Trump puts the tariffs in place? The impact well, uh, no, I think much have? more significant is his proposal to reduce, because he is pro-business, to reduce corporation tax from 25 to 15% Which, in the funny States. Which, funny enough, Vance is completely against. He actually wants to increase corporation Well, put it taxes. like this, that, 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 that would be music to, to our ears. On the UK side, meeting and checkers, so all the people, oh, isn't it awful, the two of them swigging pints, and isn't it awful, you know, in terms of uh, he'll come over for the match and all that. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Uh, the Legacy Act, uh, which basically, I was heard someone was very witty, uh, you know, when you're having a political discussion in Northern Ireland, someone says, you know, let's focus on the future. And someone said, no, the past is much more interesting. And that is, you know, they're in a time warp in Northern Ireland. So put it like this, just from a trade perspective, from a common travel perspective, from a neighbourly perspective, and the EU relationship, I actually think we can be Britain's best friend in the EU, even though we're a small player. And I think that whole reset, whoever wins the next Irish general election, is a really, really positive thing. We've spoken about his Irish connections from McSweeney to Sue Gray. And to he got Pat a new McFadden. Johnny Gall jersey. Yeah, yeah, no, he's put it like this. This, this is this thaw. Like I, you know, the the relationship with the Tories turned toxic in the end, and people should, you know, every time they they they, they sort of gro- groan about American politics, I think they should have a sigh of relief about the more immediacy of UK politics. Well, can I tell you about the pints? Yeah, what I think about that. Diageo. Right. Uh, there's two things involving pints this week, because there was the picture of Harrison Starmer clinking their glasses and having their pint before going into dinner in Checkers. And Michal Martin was out in Kenya. In darkest Africa. <laughs> and, and, and in uh, Nigeria. And uh, he went to um, a, a brewery over there. And Alcohol Action Ireland condemned both the photograph uh, in Checkers and uh, Michal Martin going to the brewery in Africa. How ridiculous is that? Yeah, more right? NGO nonsense. 
Well, here's the funny thing. Do you know who funds Alcohol Action Ireland? The HSE is the major donor to yeah. it. And you have things like the J.P. McManus Foundation is also one of the major donors to it as well. So this, I mean, like, as Michal Martin, I think with a touch of frustration, I mean, if there's one politician in this country who you would not describe as a boozer, it's Michal Martin. But I'd and say he, he likes a pint, pint well, of that's But he came out and he said, look, hang on a second. There's nothing wrong with drinking in moderation. But was it not zero, zero Guinness he was drinking? <laughs> <laughs> the point is... You know, Complete they, waste of time. Alcohol Action are undermining their own campaigns. Yes, there are issues. They came up with figures, I don't know how they reach it, suggesting that the cost of alcohol to Ireland annually is 12.5 billion euro yeah. in relation to uh, health costs and uh, productivity loss and domestic violence. And, and absolutely, I can understand when there are times when alcohol is drunk to excess, it does create major issues like that. But on the other hand, alcohol is responsible for tens of thousands of jobs in production and in selling and look at the hospitality or the experience economy and all of the tax revenues that are collected in relation... And our history. So, and, uh, so I think well, I, I think Alcohol Action Ireland uh, needs to get a yeah, grip. It, yeah. needs to, it needs to pick its battles and this yeah. was an incredibly stupid one. On, on a lighter note, take. someone who would have been from, from your ilk, uh, Fiek Kelly... Yes. Of the Irish Times. He's gone. Formerly of the Irish Times. No, yeah, 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 no, he's public affairs. Would you believe it? He is, because you know, I'm very fond of Croke Park in the context of the prawn cocktail set, the boxes, the premier things. And all. He's given me three invites to matches and I just haven't been in Dublin or unable to go. But Fia, don't, I'm honest, giving Fia all the credit for the two pints in checkers. Uh, he's doing a great job. I, I suggest he's actually only making the offer of the tickets to you knowing you won't take them up. <laughs> I hope he didn't offer you tickets for the match on Sunday. No, he didn't. He didn't. No, he no, 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 because he'd be looking at his Cork clientele for that. Well, but Diageo, I, I, I didn't get an offer, but there you go, <laughs> sort of thing like that. And anyway, that that was that. The other thing, though, just coming back a little bit to Trump, because I want to connect it to Kulak. Yeah. And you might actually wonder why I'm connecting it, but you know the type of individuals who were involved in whipping up the local youth to engage in the violence in Kulak are the type of individuals who will be whooping it up for Trump. And you can call that virtue signalling now or what, and I don't care if you try and do... Deplorables, but yeah. They are deplorables. And, OK, we've, there are 19 people facing charges in relation to what happened up in Kulak. But, you know, when I, I'm hearing a lot of nonsense as well. You know, people saying that if only the community was engaged and have conversations with the community beforehand, none of this trouble would happen. Really? I suspect that if you start telling in advance where you plan to open these things, you're giving the arsonists a heads up as to where to head to because that's what we've seen around the country on regular occasions that when there has been official news given about the opening of particular places as um, asylum centres, somebody comes along with a barrel of petrol and a, a lighter and up the place well, goes. Well, I'm going to surprise you now because I actually think in the first instance You'll remember there was nights of rioting, I think, in Brixton in London. There was nights in Paris, was it last summer, the summer before. There was the Floyd, Minneapolis, uh, uh, black riots uh, and so on. Black Lives Matter. Yes. So the the first thing you need to do is to restore order. And I accept that. There's absolutely unequivocal about that. But there used to be a thing when you drive around the country, you'd see accident black spot. I think we need to be honest in this country and have a conversation about social black spots in this country. And and I'll name them. Uh, Finglas, uh, Ballymun, the North uh, Inner City, uh, parts of West and North Belfast, parts of Derry, uh, and, and, and so on. And, and these are stigmatised ghettos and a security response is just not enough. And, and, and the point is this, I would love to see some hard data in terms of the distribution and placement of migrants, whether they're international protection or Ukrainians and whether they've been put in working class areas. 500 in Kulak and you're surprised in the Crown Paints thing? I mean, like, why not build an apartment block in the Crown Paints thing and make it, you know... Uh, well, I'm gentrify sure, it I'm or sure whatever. I'm sure the locals be objecting to that as well. Well, I, I doubt it. But anyway, the, the point the point I'm trying to make is this, that if if successive governments think that the Kulak problem can be, ju- and I'm, I'm not talking about this particular protest or arson or criminal activity, but if you dismiss 
uh, these people without looking at the context socially, you're, they're going to come back and it's going to bite you again. OK, well, let's move on to other things. I mean, can, can I just say one other thing that I think is interesting, that the review Sinn Féin did into the election outcome came to the conclusion that A, they got the referendums wrong and B, migration has caused them problem. And next Monday, they're launching a new policy document, which will promise more resources and faster turnaround times. But uh, there is no doubt that Sinn Féin can't attempt to go back from 12% to 20% without getting hardcore urban working class votes back. And that means an anti-migrant stance. And I think you're going to see that emerging on Monday. Well, it was interesting this week that um, Mary Lou MacDonald became very Michael Healy Ray because she actually, in being legitimately outraged by the threats that have been made against her in a video that was widely circulated. Which was outrageous. Which was outrageous. Yeah. It, it, much of what she said was very similar to what Michael Healy Ray had said the previous week in the Doyle and in an interview that he did with me. And when I actually interviewed Michael Healy Ray on the last word, I put it to him that he was uh, he wanted to clamp down on social media, that he wanted people not to be saying these things, and that the social media sites had to take responsibility. And I said because he had been the victim of hateful comments yeah. on the basis and his of mother. who he is and yeah. his mother yeah. because he's a politician. Yeah, and yet. He was against the hate speech bill, right? And I quoted back to him from various press releases from the rural independents about you can't have suppression of free speech. So, you know, on the one hand, he was arguing you can't have suppression of free speech. And then when it's targeted at him, sorry, this is dreadful. The social media companies must be stopped from distributing this, right? And sorry, let me finish this. Mary Lou MacDonald was making similar points this week in relation to having a stopping social media sites allowing this material mm. up. But then Sinn Féin was in favour of the hate speech bill. And then when they saw the way the wind was blowing it, they thought they decided they're against it. And the reason they're against it, the people who are leading the campaign against the hate speech bill are the type of people who are going to burn out asylum centres and they were people who are starting the protests and the likes of Kulak, who often come from areas outside of Kulak to try and whip up local sentiment against immigrants and the rest of it. You know, you can't have your cake and eating it. Well, if I had my way, I would fine TikTok 5 million euros for facilitating that an, an, an anonymous guy in Balvaclava for doing that as just one example. And until those platforms have really seer, serious penalties against them, it is their job. We wouldn't know of this sort of underbelly of Irish life but for social media and the social media platforms have to take responsibility. So They're making to, a you fortune. You want to clamp down on free speech? I, I, I want to, no, I want to enforce the Digital Services EU Act because it's not being enforced and material which is already covered in the Incitement to Hatred Act uh, going back over 10 years is already on the statute books and my understanding is there may be prosecutions so we don't need new legislation. What we need is to to enforce it and to make the TikToks of this world liable. OK, we'll see what happens in relation to that. So you're against the hate speech bill as well. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, let's move to Europe. Ursula von der Leyen. I'm favour of freedom of speech. Yeah. Carry on, yeah. Freedom of speech as long as you like what the speech is, is it? No, 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 no. I'm not like you. I don't disdain uh, lots of lots of uh, sensible comment. You were saying? I think you do disdain <laughs> a lot of sensible <laughs> comment. You actually call it gaslighting and yeah. you call it virtue signalling. Anyway, let's move on to your friend Esther. Ursula von der Leyen, as yeah. the rest of us yes, know her, yes, as, yes, okay? Yes, okay. Uh, who has now, of course, been confirmed for a second term as president of the European Commission. And a number of interesting things arise out of her confirmation this week. One, which I think is quite amusing, is um, the idea that she's come back and told our government, I want a female nominee as well as Michael McGrath. So what are they going to do in relation to that? Because Michael McGrath has given up his job as Minister for Finance. He has to be. Could it be that if they refuse to give a female alternate, that that's going to impact on whatever job he gets in the commission? Or could it be that the likelihood of a good job for him has been completely undermined by Fianna Fáil MEPs deciding to vote against her, publicly coming out despite the fact that it was a secret ballot and saying, we are not voting for her to be president? Yeah, uh, I think this is a classic example of the difference between optics and politics. Esther, Ursula. Ursula. Uh, uh, yeah, no, 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 call her what you will, is now the most powerful politician in Europe. 
There was a time the Merkel-Macron axis ran Europe. They have effectively lost all their power. Schultz doesn't have, you know, there's no government effectively in France. Uh, They're a busted flush and Schultz is a busted flush. So she is now sailed into a situation with 401 votes, ending up with the Greens supporting her. You know, she's 50 of a majority. A stingingly strong endorsement. She is now, you know that, was it um, the the, the, the old US Secretary of State, Kissinger, was it? You know, when you want to talk to Europe, who do you ring? You now ring Esther. Uh, the fact of the matter is that she is 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 not only going to pursue the Green Deal, fit for 55 and all that, she has now got a mandate for a proper defence commissioner, a defence budget and an EU defence policy. Yeah, where are we going to sit within all of that? Well, put it like this, we'll have to take our responsibility seriously. I think in the area of cyber security, in the area of the transatlantic thing, we're not going to be you know, having an artillery and armory, you know, that's just not going to happen. But I think everyone should play their role. There's already hybrid activity in relation to both the UN in terms of peace enforcement and that. So I, I actually don't you see know that as a problem. I, I think we will actually have an expanded conversation about that during one of our summer specials for the month of August because that fits in very much in the left-right divide in Irish politics that I want to talk about. Okay, on your question of Michael McGrath, I I don't think there's any precedent that if a government really, really, really wants someone and have made a public pronouncement about someone, I don't think it's the the decision, whatever about gender uh, uh, equality and so on, uh, for them not to do it. And there'll be horse trading between now and November, both in terms of portfolios. But So he will be the commissioner, but the thing is, will he be punished by getting a lesson? That will put it like this. I, I you kindly sent me uh, the interview um, that uh, Phil Hogan did um, uh, with the Business Post where he said not to expect too much. Incidentally, I was going to wind you up because uh, it's now Dr. Phil Hogan. He's been conferred with uh, a UCD uh, doctorate in political science and he sent me a photograph about two weeks ago of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the hat they wear and the gowns and all that. And I said, I'm going to send this to Matt to wind him up. And he said, don't. Don't, it'll only make it worse. Uh, so the fact is, we we'll now have to refer to him as Doctor Phil. Uh, but he he had a lot of interesting. You do know who the other Doctor Phil I is. I do, Dr. I do, I do. But the, the, put it like this: the, the point I'm trying there to make. There would be a striking physical similarity between the two men as well. Well, I don't know the other Doctor <laughs> Phil, but 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 he's now an elevated status as uh, as I say, a uh, political scientist of 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 note. Um, so so but he had some very interesting things to say. That I have spoken to Phil. About a year Dr. ago, Phil, yeah, Doctor Phil, in about. the context of Fine Gael's prospects and the re-selection, this was under Leo's ear, and he he was the one who gave me the figure of twenty five seats. Uh, he is now talking because he's a big fan of Harris's and a big supporter of Harris's and an advisor to Harris, uh, forty seats, which I thought was interesting. And he identified Cork South West, uh, South Tipperary, and a few because all these conventions are underway. Now, Ivan, you want to talk about inheritance tax? Well, it's just you raised this last week when I was in Tormakidi, and I actually hadn't thought about it that much. So the, the argument is the threshold from a parent to a child is 335,000 and it should be raised. Uh, I think it will be raised somewhere between 50 and 70,000. Uh, I've seen a figure of 65,000 mentioned because of asset inflation is running three and a half times year on year the rate of the consumer price index. And, and so therefore to confer the same or to uh, transfer the same asset requires an adjustment to it. But you know what I'd do? I do. And this is a real vote because you know me, I am just mercenary when it comes to opportunity in politics, you know, give the people what they want. I would say that the party who says, Fine Gael or Fianna Fáil, we will exempt the family home up to the value of a Dublin uh, three-bed semi-D, say 1.3 million uh, in Dublin, exempt that from all inheritance tax. I think that would be a winner because this is an illiquid a- asset. It, 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 you know, therefore, you might have to sell the family home if you give it to one of your children. The second thing I would say in terms of equity is that every tax we have, income tax, you have a standard rate and you have a top rate, 40%, whatever. 
why is there not two rates of capital gains tax? In other words, that if the super rich give their son or daughter a 10 million gift, that would be taxed much higher than 33%. But if someone is just given a family home up to say 1.3 million or whatever, it's treated differently. So I actually would do a radical reform of the capital acquisitions tax. I would have a tiered rate and I would say that the super rich are going to be creamed uh, and, and there are certain agricultural reliefs. Sorry, I'd that's put a cap on because, those. I'd put a cap well, on because those. because at the moment... They're driving up land prices. Well, because at the moment yeah, you've actually preempted what I was going to say in relation to that. There is a sort of a second tier because there is business and agricultural land relief on the transfer in the event of death about 90% exemption. So that is why... Without a cap. Yeah, that is why an awful lot of wealthy people have been buying land because they can transfer it effectively tra- tax-free to their beneficiaries of their will. But I think there's a very serious issue here in relation to whether this is actually fair and whether this distorts the property market for people who are trying to make their own way. So, you know, you talk about it, the gifts on death, but a lot of people actually gift the 335,000 tax-free before death, yeah. which is used then as a deposit on the purchase of a house, which makes that completely distorts the market, making it really unfair that the wealthy are able to give a significant leg up to their children against those who have no wealth and who are earning their own way in competing to buy housing. And, you know, there is this argument made as well. Oh, well, they've paid all their taxes. Well, we don't know that these people have paid all their taxes before death. They also would have benefited from mortgage interest relief and other various tax reliefs in buying their house and in paying off their mortgage previously. So this is something of a clawback. It's only 33% and it's only on the amount beyond 335. So everyone is going on as if the whole country is full of single children who are inheriting 1 million euro houses. It actually happens quite rarely. And in most cases, actually, it's going to be two or three or four children who are inheriting. So that brings you up to 1.3 million. And there aren't that many houses that are inherited for 1.3 million. The amount of revenue that's actually brought in by the state is 0.6% of the overall tax take in inheritance tax. But fundamentally, what it should be is that there should be no threshold. Basically, it should be that people should be actually paying 33% on well, the transfer. Talk about reds under the bed. Oh, sorry, the, mean, red, <laughs> the reds don't go for that. Sorry. The most bizarre <laughs> thing of all is that the left-wing parties like People Before Profit and the rest of it are also into exempting the um, the family home from this. You'll see when if this is announced in the budget, a raising of the exemptions, you won't see Sinn Fein or the left complaining about this. They Look, all go away with the I remember there was a well, controversy. Remember there was a controversy about twenty years ago involving an appointment that the Sunday Independent made and uh Owen Harris's first wife was Anne Harris yes. and some relative there, maybe a daughter was appointed to something. And I was happened to be speaking to Owen Harris and he said, Ivan, newsflash, uh, parents tend to look after their kids. It's human nature. And I thought, you know what? That is a really honest statement. Get over yourself, Matt. The fact of the matter is the reason why people get out of bed in the morning is to do stuff over their lifetime for their kids. And it's a very good thing. What about letting their kids look after themselves and selling moddy moddy coddling? Peter Casey actually has that policy. He he made 20, 30 million or more, uh, Tata and so on. And he has a policy the kids will get nothing. Uh, I put it like this. Stand on their own feet. No, no. I, I think if a parent wants to transfer, you say they have four kids and they want to transfer the family home to one, and the house is worth 1.3 million you cannot sell a bit of a house you cannot divide it up the reality is if you want to continue that tradition particularly in rural areas which you're insensitive to the fact of the matter is this is a fair thing to do to exempt the family home and to have a tiered rate whereby the super rich pay more But you do know as well that if one of the adult children is still living in the house that they get it's tax exempt anyway. Oh, is it? I didn't know if that. If they're living, okay. if it's their place of residence. Okay. Okay. Well, so I, well so so the, in so all might, of this, you I, might, you I, might, you I, might have certain I've situations. Done a, I've done tremendous tax planning myself. I've set up companies, trusts, and everything. So, I, you know, when you read the Sunday Independent, but will you actually, Sunday papers, will you have any money to leave to anyone? Well, well that, that is the secret. Uh, you know, dentist died, lawyer died worth 18 million. 
What an idiot. In other words, yeah, why you don't should, you, why you should just enjoy your money no, no, now and no, spend it. Why don't it? you just funnel it all out and do proper tax planning and you needn't pay a red cent? Why don't you just spend it and enjoy living it? I mean, I know you'll gamble it I away. There's only so many pints I can drink in one day. Yeah, but you can gamble big sums only of money for, and lose I'm still it. paying 540 for a pint and I'll, more than I can manage and live on my money. So, I mean, like, the, the, bottom, the bottom line is I think there's a real opportunistic market to do radical reform of gift tax and inheritance tax. Okay, Leo Varadkar has announced he's not standing again for election. No surprise in that. But what I thought was very significant was Pascal Donoghue has confirmed he will be running again. Are you surprised at that? I am. Or do you believe him? Do you think he, I, <laughs> he could hardly drop out at the very last minute once he's made a... In fairness, I think when Pascal Donoghue makes a commitment... I would expect him to honour it. He's, I think he's conscientious. Well, uh, when he got that IMF offer that uh, dissipated, he was ready to go. So it, that'll be opportunity led to. On Leo, I, I just think we it, it is worthy. Uh, between 07, when he was elected a TD, over a 17-year period, he achieved more than people did in 30 years. So what do you think, uh, what do I think his legacy will be? I think that if you look at sort of the changes that Enda Kenny and Gilmore era brought about, they really didn't want to touch the abortion issue. They were all for marriage equality, of which I think Leo coming out was a game changer in terms of of, of shifting people's minds and and sort of popularising all of that. But I think the handling of Brexit, but more particularly the abortion referendum, now in all of this politics, a team game, I would give credit to Micheál Martin, right? But I thought that wouldn't have happened. Secondly, I'm not so sure under an older politician, Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil would have ultimately buried the Civil War hatchet. I think he deserves some credit for that and he managed that well. The National Children's Hospital will probably turn out to be a success and while he's taken short term flag but there, there's a particular moment this year uh, earlier this year that I thought he did serve with distinction and nobody has a good word to say about Leo and the fortunes of the party have recovered nobody in Fine Gael has two, two good words to say. at the, the sort of speech he gave at the graveside of John Bruton I thought well now fair play he just he spoke about it both in a personal way and in a sense of history way and I thought that that's kind of like proper Taoiseach talk. Okay, can I remind you yeah. that when he stepped down as leader of Fine Gael and yeah, Taoiseach, right. you were yeah. incandescent with rage. I said you, it was selfish. I said it was yeah, selfish. And you felt that he had snookered the party and it turns out and if you remember rightly, I was saying to you, maybe they'll get a bounce out of this. Maybe he was tired. Maybe they needed something fresh and new. Seven weeks is plenty of time. And it was plenty of time yeah. for them to turn around the European But Parliament no one saw elections. that Harris would turn into this action man figure that he's been. No, I didn't try and claim that. No, I yeah, no, no, I, I totally but, agree. They yeah. Like normally, like there was a coronation instead of a contest, unlike yeah. the Greens. Uh, and everything that they've handled since, it brought energy, it brought uh, urgency uh, to the party. And that is why someone like Phil Hogan is penciling them up from 25 to 40 seats. So I actually just on that, I think Fianna Fáil's goal is 45 seats. Like everything I see through the prism of what's going to happen Sorry, to the I, 147, I, Is it going to be 74. a Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael coalition not needing any other help? Oh no, oh no, they'll definitely need help. They definitely help. need help. Uh, but so the abortion referendum, FFFG, uh, LGBT, all of those areas, I think where he failed... Uh, is he misread the national mood on migration uh, badly. Uh, his second term completely lacked the energy of COVID in the first term. But uh, I wish him well for the future. I think he'll get a big gig internationally and to, to some extent as a former teacher, it's okay for Bertie to meander around as an old fella. You know what I mean? And maybe muse about the presidency. Oh, we must do a special on the presidency. We will. It's a completely different... Like the last two presidential elections were completely completely overshadowed by Michael D. Now that he's off the pitch... Uh, it's going to, off the pitch. No, no, year away no, 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 but it, it, the, the point is this, it's going to be a completely different combat. OK, well, look, so there's a few other things we need to talk about. Oh, sorry, just in relation to a uh, constituency, I was very taken by the fact that Eamon Ryan made it clear he was canvassing for Claire Byrne to replace him as a candidate in Dublin Bay South and she got beaten by kiss Hazel death, Chew. Kiss yeah. Kiss of death. Yeah, I wonder was it actually a mistake for him to be seen to actively canvass? I think, I know he felt she used to work as his assistant. She is a very, very able politician. I've dealt with her on a few occasions. Claire or Claire, Hazel? No, they're both are, but particularly I think Claire Byrne is. And uh, 
I think she would have been a very good candidate for them. Yeah. In in this kind, of, I think Hazel Chu will be a good candidate yeah, for yeah, them as well. In yeah. fairness, uh, but I just thought the significance was that it just shows you that when you step away from power, suddenly your power really oh, is gone. Isn't absolutely. It? And why is he still in the ministry? It's an absolute joke. Now I hear next Wednesday, big decision, last cabinet meeting before uh, the Holl- Holliers. And RTE. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm off to Galway Races actually for a very intense for my liver uh, week, uh, uh, the last week before the builder's holiday starts. By the way, um, there, there's there's consternation in the construction industry about Irish water. Just uh, give, you, give me two minutes on this. The, uh, Irish water has a budget of 1.4 billion. They decided to give a rebate of all capital contributions paid by developers to Irish water. The state has not made up this money. They have urgently written to Harris this week before he goes into all years. There are, like, take a, a micro example, in ovens in County Cork. I don't know where it is. but it's there's out beyond Ballincolic. Okay, 110 houses, city. planning permission refused this week for over 50 houses simply because there's no sewage. This is now going to be a feature on top of all the other planning problems. They must urgently deal with this. Okay, week. and I, I should we just jump on to Irish Water before our tea because... Uh, there's a couple of things here. They're looking for an additional immediate 400 million to fill the gap. But it's actually the capital requirement for the next five years or so is yeah. going to be much bigger. That's a major issue. And there's two things I'll say about that. One, it all has to come from the state because they were unable to recoup some of their financial needs through water charges of domestic homes. <clears throat> so that's one thing, but we're not revisiting that one. That won't yeah. be happening politically. But the second issue is if you, and I think this is something again we might do in one of our summer specials, how we plan for a future of over 7 million people. Yeah. The CSO figures this week were absolutely fascinating on the projections. And if 20th century Ireland was characterised by emigration, 21st century Ireland is going to be characterised by what year is that 7 million figure? Do you know? By 2057. But we'd still I'm have... 64 and it's now 24. So I, I needn't worry about that really. Okay, but you do Maybe, have... I you think do you children. needn't worry you about do, that. You do have children and grandchildren, <laughs> Ivan. It's not all about you. I mean, let's face it, you are trying to funnel enough money away for them to inherit. Anyway, leaving that aside, you have these projections and a lot of that, that population growth will come in the immediate future as well. As long as the economy keeps growing and for the economy to keep growing and for us to have the money to provide the housing, there's going to be a massive state investment required in infrastructure. Water is just one thing. The electricity grid yeah. to be able to cope with 7 million people and all the businesses. In, it's also within that, the estimate is 3 to 3.3 billion people will be at work the demands upon the electricity grid. So that means that intensifies our need to get the wind energy going. And I sometimes want, I wonder as well, this is where another one of the great conundrums is going to be, which we might discuss again at greater length, is um, will our capital investment be constrained by environmental concerns in that we need to do things, but we're told you can't do that because of the carbon impact. Just, just the difference between electricity which is also strangled by planning, is that developers and the private sector is ready to spend the money. Absolutely. In the water and wastewater, it's dependent on the state. Like, you look at that chart there, in 2022, the number of tenders, the value of the tenders has steeply declined. So we're now looking at a situation that specialist water contractors and wastewater are actually moving to the UK. They're letting people go. This is absolutely urgent. And 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 this letter dated the, the 15th of July from the CIF to Simon Harris should be one of the most urgent things he gives consideration. I think next week after that cabinet meeting on Wednesday, we will finally have the full announcement as to what's happening with RT. And the license fee. We already it's know it's gone a bit on longer of it. than Coronation Street at this point. And you stage. know what? People, I think, have come completely bored with it. Yeah. Because I know this week, sometimes when, when we do items on the radio, and you'll know this from yeah. when you were doing things on News Talk. The text. The text. Well, I used to always drive the text by, by, by saying contrarian things, you know, trolling and all that you, kind of You mean you were actually saying things you didn't believe? Oh, deliberately. Absolutely. To My drive. God, what to a drive. shock. <laughs> what a shock that is. Anyway, right. Anyway, the point is that I. You remember the lady who won the Ballon d'Or or some of the Gold, uh, the, Stephanie the, Roach. Yeah, I slated her as tokenism and it drove... Did you see the goal? It, it, ah, the, the goalie missed it. I blame the goalie entirely. Like the fact is, something like that is a classic opportunity for me so on air to when, drive contrarian opinion. And they don't realise this so tongue in cheek. Ro- so when Ronnie Whelan scored his goal in 88 against Russia from outside the area, the volley off the Mick McCarthy throw. Did you blame Dasayev and the Russian goal for not saving it? No, but the point is if she oh, wasn't but, no, if she wasn't a woman, she wouldn't have got it. It was tokenism. 
Okay, I am absolutely <laughs> gobsmacked by that one. Anyway, the point I was coming to is that um, the listeners... RT. RT were not ex- exercised by the licence fee to anything like the degree they were by the inheritance tax yep. discussion that we were having or by what was happening in Kulak this week, that there's a fatigue in relation yeah. to RT. But it's still investment. important. But it's still important. And this is the thing which I'm wondering now, are we going to see effectively confirmation... A lot of people in the media business used to give out about dual funding for RT, that it had the license fee and that it had commercial revenue. Now it's going to have triple funding because it's going to have the license fee, it's going to have the commercial revenue and it's going to have an extra stream of revenue from the state, which effectively we're paying for on top of our license fees already. So there's going to be a big job of work having to be done to show how that is fair, how the state is going to get value for money from RTE for what it does and how that's going to impact on all other media. Well, first of all, uh, they've shown Catherine Martin the door with her exchequer funding, which is a tick in the box of doing something sensible. But let's be clear about this. We need to put this in a proper context. They talk about long-term funding. You know how much when you add it up that RT have actually looked for for the next five years? 1.3 billion. And how uh, the politicians, because just out of sheer spineless uh, uh, fear with the coming election, they want good RTE coverage. The fact of the matter is 256 million a year they're looking for in public funding. Go take a running jump. Uh, you know, I, like Terence O'Rourke should have appointed uh, uh, some sort of examinership administration to this because how many people have actually be, been put in the voluntary early retirement? None. What have they done to do independent production? They've faffed around about the Late Late Show and so on. The truth is this is all smoke and mirrors and the government have allowed this, the, uh, you know, and th- this is all sticking plaster stuff. I saw Harris saying in, in Checkers four principles that it needed to be sustainable, it needed to be long lasting, the need to be public service broadcasting that covers other broadcasters. Like, it's all hot air. Call it as it is. RTE is a relic of the past, needs to be radically reformed, and this feather bedding by politicians of 1.3 million should not be indulged. Do you reckon, though, will it have any impact electorally with voters? Will they care when it comes to voting as to how the government has spent their money in RTE? Look, if I was to focus on every issue in terms of being right and wrong and the right thing to do is economic sensibility and all that kind of thing and what the voters care, sure, I told you, we don't have the most uh, educated electors in the world. Most of them haven't a clue what's happening in the country. So you decided to troll our listenership, have you, at the end by <laughs> no, insulting them, is it? No, no, the, the, the tens of thousands that listen to us are probably a little bit more cerebral than and your you, average punter. And you think so the others are the deplorables, is it? No, 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 they're just the ignorant. <laughs> Oh my God. But <laughs> RTE, RTE, the truth is not being told. This is a bottomless pit. Very interesting conventions at the weekend. My neighbouring constituency is Wicklow, Wexford. Fianna Fáil, I think, is on Sunday and Fine Gael is on Monday. To give you an example, uh, so this is a hybrid new constituency. Will votes cross the county boundary? 35,000 in Wexford, 25,000 in, Wexford, in, in Wicklow. So I hear Paddy Kennedy and Malcolm Byrne are going to be the Fianna Fáil candidates. Uh, Brian Brennan, who used to run the the Arklow Bay Hotel and living in uh, Gorey is likely to be a Fine Gael candidate. But keep an eye out for Peter Stapleton. He is a youngster who got in to the council with 2,000 votes in an unelectable area around West Wicklow. Uh, I think they might run two there. Are there any women? That is actually the biggest problem with running two in some of these constituencies, that if you run two men, you're going to really mean there's going to be some constituency in Finnegan. They're going to have to run a dozen women just to get the money, okay. the public funding. OK, we will leave it there. We'll have lots to talk about next week when we get confirmation of what the government is doing in RTE. Uh, we suspect that if it hasn't already happened by the time that you're listening to this, Joe Biden will Well, at have least you move. weren't insufferable about Cork. I was expecting you to go on and on and on about the divine right of the rebels to win on Sunday. You, you, you're in the, like, you would never admit that you're in a, a box, would you? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> but I want to be humble. I like the free stuff. We've know. been humbled in Cork, you know, by the fact we haven't won. Humble? That's right. That is an oxymoron of ever, though. We haven't won one since 2005, which will probably provide the drive 
And particularly, in some respects, it may be good that we're playing Clare because we remember that we lost a replay to Clare in 2013. You couldn't begrudge Clare. 2013, uh, the Banner County, they have nothing going for them. Cork is greedy, clannish, got everything going for it. No, I, I'm up for the, the Banner County because they, they, they deserve it. They've been knocking on the door for a while. Cork are very Johnny-come-lately. You say Clare have nothing. They've got Shannon Airport and they've got Doon Beg, Trump Doon Beg. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we need to play up that link. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's it for today. If you've enjoyed this, please recommend us to a friend and tell them you can get it on Apple, Spotify, wherever it is that they get their podcasts, YouTube as well. And uh, we'll have lots to talk about next week. As I said, we will have the end of term for the cabinet and uh, we'll give you some details of some of the summer specials that we intend doing and other things that aren't on the podcast We'll tell you all about those next week. So from me, Matt Cooper. And from Clara Boo, Ivan. <laughs> Go on the Rebels. <laughs>